What's up, Barefoot Nation? So the garden is actually looking phenomenal for this early April. It uh, is pretty rainy today, so I'm, I do have a topic that I want to talk about, which I'm not particularly excited about. Let me explain. Before I get started, is you can do things like this, like this feature wall, which I thought was really cool at the time. Anyways, that's probably what you're going to be looking at most of the video. There's not too much planty stuff. It's kind of a, a little bit, yeah, it's a rant. If the rant is not for you, then I will see you next week, hopefully with an April garden tour. And uh, yeah, it should be absolutely phenomenal. Thanks for watching. Okay guys, so I want to talk about invasive species today and what pisses me off about the invasive species argument. Now I'm doing a different format just to see how this goes. Um, I do have some notes here. I was actually going to make this video have a clickbait title, but I don't want to do that to y'all. So people say that native plants are better adapted to the environment, but yet invasive plants um, somehow are better adapted than the natives. Um, weird. But it's not even really that that I want to talk about because really what I want, what pisses me off is the inconsistency of, of the invasive species argument. Like, I live in New York and so a plant which is invasive just about everywhere within its hardiness range is the Bradford or Calorie pear. Well, I guess before I get into the pear, I want to talk about what is what's called Western New York uh, Prism. One of the events that I go to early before, way in February, like when there, I mean, there wasn't snow on the ground this year, but way when there's snow on the ground, um, and you know, all of the, this event where all the professionals coalesce into this one venue, and uh, it's, a, it's a couple days, it's a good time, it's your tired So venue. this lady was talking about invasive species, and so, because she's from PRISM, and so um, she had on her list the black locust. Well, black locust, which I will put a picture up, is a plant that is native to the eastern states but what she was saying was it's considered invasive in New York the a whole state of New York because this one little area the coastal plain so that I believe would so this picture here if you are in New York is actually a pretty good amount of info or extra info which is what your zones are based on so pause it and take a look. Because the potential for this black locust tree, which is kind of a colony form, it's actually very popular in permaculture because it's a great plant. Um, it's a nitrogen fixing tree. It flowers. I believe it has edible components as well. It does sucker, so it will form a colony, which I'll get into. Um, but this black locust tree is considered invasive in the whole state because this one part of New York, uh, it's, you know, displacing or ch not even displacing as much as changing the soil and the environment and the conditions. Nature is always changing. What if the coastal plains shrink because, you know, they need to because some other habitat is going to ebb and flow? So let me get into a little bit about clonal. So basically um, what they're saying is plants that um, spread vegetatively. So if you imagine this cast iron plant is a terrible example because they grow so slowly. But this cast iron plant here, the way that it spreads primarily is vegetatively. So in other words, you can divide a piece of this plant off, right? And so I could divide this off if I wanted to, and, and it would spread and regrow. And so this plant does not primarily spread through seeds like a strawberry plant. 
um, saying is that's an invasive plant. That's an invasive quality. Well, let me tell you, um, any native plant people out there familiar with sumac or rudbeckia or elderberry or um, run down the list. You want to talk about plants that are clonal? You want to talk about clethra and itea? I had to re-record that because I was doing this for too long and that's not like the meditative, <laughs> it was something else. So, um, maybe we don't want to go down the whole rabbit hole of anything clonal is bad because obviously that's not true. Oh yeah, you want to talk about a clonal plant? How about the common milkweed? Yeah, and again, the kicker here is nuance. I am not saying that I don't like these plants that I just listed. I love them. I have most of them. Not the milkweed, because... I can grow other varieties that are more suitable for small spaces and wetter spaces. So the, <laughs> so the other curious thing, too, about kind of going after plants that change the conditions of the soil, which is any plant, um, how about conifers? which drop their needles to the ground and that has a tendency to acidify soil, which usually happens in deserts, which are usually alkaline or drier environments. How about trees that break up the rocks on top of mountains? Maybe I'm losing the forest for the trees with what I'm saying. Let me know down in the comments because as long as it's not a dumpster fire of a dumpster fire then you know we can have a good debate I would love to have a good debate getting back to the DEC for a second which is New York State Department of Environmental I always want to say conversation but it's conservation so uh, getting back to the DEC for a second you know what else she said in that talk when there's a plant like buckthorn or honeysuckle which are net like truly invasive plants they don't do anything about it anymore they've spread out of control. Yeah, you heard that right. Not making this crap up. So that to me, oh, and she also said too, cause I was like, yeah, I moved into a house. I had some buckthorn in the back and I cut them down and I stripped off the bark. And she's like, well, yeah, that's great. But not, every ha not everyone has the ability to do that. I, 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 I um, um, landscapers, hey, uh, can you cut down some trees for me? Can you stump grind some trees for me? No? Yeah, that's kind of a service that's provided by landscapers. Whether they're cutting down a Norway maple, which I'm pointing to, but you can't see, that's invasive. They're, so another thing that the DE, that is not happening, that should, is a lanthus, is, or a tree of heaven, is not controlled, it's not listed as, I mean, I, I, I'm pretty sure that you can still order in Tree of Heaven and plant it in areas where spotted lanternfly is, um, you know, establishing itself. Which, um, spotted lanternfly, in case you're not aware, is particularly bad in Pennsylvania it's particularly, and it's in Western New York as well. It is basically the, like a generalist emerald ash borer. Weeds, I believe it has like 70 different host plants. That's crazy. Mostly fruiting plants, by the way. So anyone who likes permaculture and food forests, um, that's gonna be, well, I think it's probably particularly bad in monoculture, but not necessarily. We don't know. A uh, quick note on the spotted lanternfly is there's things like spraying dormant oil at the proper time of year, which can kill egg masses. Um, Tree of Heaven is kind of like a holly where you can have male and female plants. And so obviously the female plants will produce all the seeds and like tons of them. But the, I don't know exactly the process, but the male plants, they can basically do something to so that the eggs that get laid on it like it, it kills the insects somehow. It's a really cool process. So again, I don't want to make it sound like I don't think invasives are a problem, because they are. I'm gonna get to Bradford pear. Actually, now is a great time to talk about Bradford pear and all the different pears that 
um, are in the species Pyrus caloriana. And those plants are um, horrendous. <laughs> so, you know, and guess what? Again, they're not going after Bradford pear. They're going to wait until it's too far gone to be like, mm, maybe we should have done so. <laughs> Joel Salatin always has uh, a phrase where he's like, oops, maybe we should not have done that. Like, I'm kind of laughing about this, but it literally, anyway. So, yeah, they're going to basically wait until the Bradford pear is fully out of control to before they are like, yeah, maybe we should have fucking done it. You can go into any nursery in New York State, and landscapers love them because they're cheap, they grow quickly. So, in case you don't know, invasive plants basically are, or invasive species, we can go broad here. Invasive species are species that basically will um, grow and spread at an exponential rate. Um, and they will take over an area and displace all of the plants and animals that should be there. So a great example of a really bad invasive plant is the Bradford pear. Yeah, an invasive species is going to spread out of control and take over an area. Purple loosestrife was a problem. Um, <clears throat> Down in the south, you have different types of uh, ligustrum, japonicum, um, so like the Chinese and Japanese privet. But so like there are plants that I'm kind of focusing on plants more because that's more my forte than insects. And uh, Doug Talame is pretty good. I mean, his science is kind of skewed, but anyway, um, I think um, Tony Avent and Doug Talame should debate. Um, on like a live stream, that would be awesome. But anyway, um, Tony Avent from Plant Delights Nursery, and Doug Talame, of course, wrote the famous book, which I don't have in front of. No, uh, no, don't I don't have it. So Doug Talame wrote a famous, at this point, I think, book called Bringing Nature Home, and that was something I read when I was about. 13, I want to say. I was young. And then I meet him in person and he's kind of like a self-absorbed. Importance of natives. I'm going to do a video probably next week if it's not sunny. Um, I'm going to do an April garden tour because as you saw in the very beginning, everything looks fantastic. But also too, I, I will be doing a video on native plants and why they're important, probably when they're in leaf. Um, which one of the things that uh, people say about the invasive species is that they leaf out, and this generally is true, uh, they leaf out noticeably earlier than the natives, which gives them a competitive advantage, um, which could be true, uh, but what about elderberries? What about nine bark? What pisses me off so much about this argument is you have people who are you know, saying this cut and dry black and white stuff. As I, I, I the new N word is nuance. It just is. So not only is the Bradford pear a love a plant which we love to hate. There is a ton of plants. There's a ton of plants which we have kind of unnecessarily labeled invasive. Obviously, the one that's closest to my heart is bamboo. Anyone who's watched the channel for any length of time knows how much I love bamboo. I think it's such a great, sustainable plant, and it's so useful for humanity. We can build, use its timber, we can eat it, we can, uh, you name it. I've, I've snaked a drain with a piece of bamboo before. It's, there's a lot of plants that are demonized just because it's easy to demonize them. Miscanthus is a type of ornamental grass. I've been professionally doing horticulture now for somewhere around 13 years or so. In all of that time, I have seen two Miscanthus seedlings. Two, not 20. And yet, if you look at it and you read all this stuff, you that people would have you believe that Miscanthus grass is this horrible invasive. And yet, I don't see the evidence. Gunnera in the UK, as of recently, has just been picked on by bureaucrats, basically. I, I, <laughs> and, okay, I 
<laughs> I haven't ever set foot in the UK yet. I'd love to go someday. Kew Gardens would be amazing. Um, <clears throat> they won't let me in now. But um, all I can really speak of on the Gunnera issue is that I feel your pain, all of y'all in the UK, because in America, they're doing the same thing. Um, and I'm sure in the UK, there are plants that are true invasives that are not being addressed. Um, but yeah, going back to the miscanthus, based on what I've been told, it's not the spreading, it's not the seeds, it is, wait for it, miscanthus has a hollow center, as you saw, and that donut in the center makes it invasive. Um, <laughs> like, who comes up with this shit? <laughs> so, I've heard from people in North Carolina that miscanthus can be invasive in a situation where people are practicing bad forestry techniques where they're planting all of these trees, the monoculture of the same tree over a big area at the same time and they clear cut the whole frickin' lot. And miscanthus, now having open soil and sun, is gonna say, okay, cool, this is what I need. So, there, I'm, again, I'm not saying miscanthus doesn't have potential to be invasive, but it's like, in that situation, what's more important? The fact that an Asian grass is growing. What's more important, preserving the soil or we're making sure that like panicum grows there, in, which is a prairie grass, not even something that would like be early succession. They wanna be in like Illinois where buckthorn is a problem, which is more important. The Preserving the soil, making sure that it doesn't all erode away because of your bad forestry practice, or making sure that there's native plants which recolonize this monoculture of trees that no longer is there because they were planted at the same time, yada, yada, yada. You see what I'm saying? Like, that's not invasive. That's nature saying, hey, you idiots, you're doing something wrong here. Anyone who's grown this plant knows that it does not do well in shade. It slowly recedes in shade. In fact, not even that slow. The plant needs a lot of sun, otherwise it doesn't do well. The one exception to that that I'm aware of, or there are a couple exceptions, but Miscanthus giganteus, which is a hybrid and it's sterile, is a plant that'll do okay in shade. Oh, by the way, miscanthus can be used as a biofuel, just like water hyacinth. We're going back to the New York DEC now for a second. I'm, I'm gonna laugh just as much as I laughed at the whole donut in the center, the hollow center thing with the uh, grass. Um, they're saying now that water hyacinth, a tropical plant, which I can't even overwinter in a fish tank, if I tried to figure out how to overwinter water hyacinth in water temperature that's like not, you can't do it, it doesn't work. And so what they're saying is water hyacinth because winters are warming, because winters are warming has the potential to be, has the potential to be invasive. So again, they're going after a plant which is not invasive and frankly, can't even be invasive in New York. Cause it's like, I don't care if you're talking about the southernmost tip of Staten Island, New York City, zone 7B, whatever it is nowadays, down there. Water hyacinth dies when it freezes. So how the hell is water hyacinth going to be invasive in this state? It's not, it's not. So like, guys, again, I want accountability. I don't want to say invasives don't exist. They do. They exist in every climate. There is some plant that probably Bradford Pear is well where you live. I love to hate Bradford Pear. We have people who 
are saying, well, we're not going to go after the real invasives. We're going to go after the invasive species that aren't invasive yet. I understand that. I understand their thinking where they're saying, look, we want to control the spread before it's a problem. Terrible research, science to say, I think that based on Columbus, Ohio, um, Bradford Pear should be banned. Top of the list. If we're going to you know, do stuff through banning, Bradford Pear goes to the top of the list. I think what I'm doing here, this is, this is my goal with this video. Some people are going to enjoy seeing me get spun up. Whatever. But I think that the best way to control invasives is through education. Hey, I have honey, bush honeysuckle, not deer villa, um, Lanicera teterica, or um, the honeysuckle by a pond, apparently the invasive one has a chemical in the leaves that drops in and decays and it makes um, less oxygen in the water now. So generally water that is oligotrophic and has a low amount of nutrients or mesotrophic, a medium amount of nutrients, is going to be better for um, most aquatic life. Back to the honeysuckle though, apparently this honeysuckle not only is allelopathic, which means which means that that plant wants to, uh, actually not just wants to, <laughs> every plant wants to be the dominant plant in an ecosystem, in an ecosystem, but you know, that's called ecology. But um, allelopathic means that the plant will actually put a chemical out into the soil in a, and it forms this monoculture where it's just honeysuckle in the understory of woodlands. And so that, is something that is really bad. And so removing the bush honeysuckle wherever possible. Uh, healthy soil is going to also be something that is hugely important. Like some people will bring up juglone with um, black walnut trees. Again, I'm pointing to a tree you can't see. But um, juglone is actually digested by soil bacteria. Not to mention, juglone encourages planting native plants because a lot of, even in unamended soil, the native plants, generally speaking, can tolerate some amount of juglone. Like, let's take water hyacinth or bamboo. I'm going to do water hyacinth for, so that I'm inclusive of all the climates. Uh, like, such as I haven't really touched on tropical climates. Invasive species that we're banning, some of them, it's almost like they're banning plants that are useful to people. Like water hyacinth, last time I checked, water hyacinth is a biofuel, it's edible, it filters heavy metals out of water, and like, yet in tropical climates, they're demonizing it because it makes it harder for boats to get through. How about we clean our waterways? Like, why is that so difficult to have clean water and you don't give the water hyacinth a home or a habitat where it has to be pulling heavy metals out of the water? And by the way, if you're gonna eat water hyacinth or anything of the sort, you probably, wanna, you probably would wanna test the water that the hyacinth is growing in before you cook it and uh, I think you do need to cook water hyacinth but um, I mean I don't understand like that should be something that is celebrated my brain's done so one thing I forgot to touch on is the other aspect to having the invasive species list bigger than it should be is that it makes plants more expensive because you have to, nurseries now have to, in many states, label a plant. It takes more time to get plants off of a truck and onto the lot and the cost of stickers and the cost of the labor for everyone to stick those stickers onto the pots or the tags or however that's being done. That's a hidden cost. That's something that no one thinks about. And it's not just a hidden cost for Bradford pears. It's a hidden cost for everything. 
efficiency is reduced. So you have 200 out of a truck that has a thousand plants. That truck is unloaded 20% slower. Or it takes 20% longer to get those plants out into the nursery. I don't like ranting, but there are just some times where some subjects where I can't help but rant about a subject. So anyways, guys, if you've gotten this far, drop a tree or some sort of plant emoji down in the comments. And I appreciate you guys watching this far. I hope you enjoyed and, and stay tuned for happier, not ranting content last week. I'm gonna go back to my normal videos. Um, my garden, as you saw in the very beginning, looks fantastic. Um, and it's early, guys. Like, I am loving this early spring. Um, I even have all the tropicals outside, which is unprecedented for early April. So, anyways, uh, I hope to see you next week. I hope I didn't piss too many people off. Um, again, nuance, 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 and, uh, hope to see you next week. Thanks for watching.